Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. I'm here with Sarah Larby today. Sarah and I are going to talk all things BRRRR, which stands for Buy, Renovate, Refinance, Rent, and Repeat. Sarah is going to break down her strategy and what she does in order to be able to capitalize on this in terms of real estate investing. I'm so excited that she's here to share her knowledge with us. She's a seasoned investor and, and has a phenomenal resume. Uh, before we get into it with Sarah, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Sarah, great to have you here. Uh, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to join us. Why don't you give us a bit of an intro on what you do as a real estate investor and tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. First and foremost, thank you for having me on. And I'm super excited. And I absolutely love your background with the wine bottles. Uh, <laughs> those of you that may know I love red wine and I've seen a lot of them. So <laughs> that is awesome. A little well bit about me. For now, that's about it. Yeah. That's about as cool <laughs> as it gets. Nice. So a little bit about me. I'm a real estate investor, started investing in 2013. And I started with a buy and hold and then realized that it was a lot faster to do the burr strategy and so got into that. Uh, currently today I've got 14 doors um, and really, you know, I haven't really fully announced this, but it's allowed me to leave my nine to five. So I've actually given my notice and I will be done in the fall and uh, have the freedom because of the burr strategy and uh, super excited about that too. In addition, I've got a couple podcasts as well. Like you, I'm a podcast host love providing content for comedians. And I also am a co-founder of The Right Club, which, which is a real estate education club, coast to coast across Canada. What else? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Coach, great. mentor, yeah, investor first and foremost, but, uh, yeah. you know, and now soon uh, to be retired from the nine to five corporate life. Awesome. First of all, congratulations. That's a big step. I know for many of us to be able to get out from, from underneath the, the, the J-O-B, um, you know, and I think that's a, that's a huge accomplish, uh, accomplishment. And obviously you've been able to do that probably through the, the investing strategies we're about to talk about today. Uh, for those people that aren't familiar with this idea of Burr, can you just kind of break it down? Like what, what, is, what is the idea behind it and why is it a strategy that many, many investors uh, want to use? Absolutely. In my opinion, it is the best of both worlds of flipping and being a buy and hold. And when you think real estate investing, when you, you first start, those are really the two top things. And there's tons of strategies, but those are really the top two things that people think about. Oh, I could be a landlord and or I could do what HGTV does and be a flipper. And I'll tell you, there's pros and cons to both of them. And one of the things that was really important for me was to build long term wealth. And also because I didn't have a whole lot of time and I was working full time, uh, in the beginning, I, I started with a buy and hold strategy because it was that opportunity to get into the market, create that long-term wealth, but I didn't have to put in a ton of hours to take away from my nine to five job that I had. So originally we started with, with buy and hold. And then, um, you know, when I say we, it's, it's me, my spouse, he's not as into the real estate thing, but he's, you know, he support, he supports me. And so that's good. Um, but then we, we realized that, um, to do some renos, and as we got more comfortable with it, helps you pull out your money a lot faster. So essentially, you buy a property, um, you look at the market fundamentals, that's going to be really important, um, and, you, and you renovate for that market, and then, and then renting it. So I, I usually try to rent actually before I, I go ahead with a refi, or at least have something on paper, because it helps with the refis as well. But screening tenants and finding the really best tenants, do not skip that step. That's a huge, important one. Um, and then you got to refinance, of course, and then you repeat. So I add four R's into the burr, because you want to take that money, you want to recycle it, and you want to buy the next one. So essentially, um, you know, seven years later, um, you know, you can change your life. And it doesn't have to take seven years, but I'll tell you, it's not a get rich quick thing, but mm -hmm. it's definitely a good way to uh, build long-term wealth and doing it a little bit faster than a regular buy and hold. Tell me how you, you go through this cycle and, you know, let's start with the buy. What, uh, what areas do you predominantly work in and why did you choose those areas? And uh, let's start there. Yeah, absolutely. So I think for me, 
the buy comes from looking at market fundamentals, right? So I have this whole checklist of, you know, what with the population is population increasing or decreasing? What are the jobs in the area? Are people moving in or out of the city? So there's actually a list of, you know, about 20 things and people can actually download it for free on my website if they want 20 things that I look for in order to pick a market. Um, I got lucky when I first started picking the market because it was just random because we knew somebody that needed to rent and we started with renting to somebody that we knew and it ended up that it was a really good market for doing that and it was in Brantford, Ontario. Um, but there's other markets that do well. And the only thing I would say is when you're buying for the birth strategy, make sure that your um, after repair value is going to be conducive to getting some cash flow. Because a lot of people will say, I want to do a burr, a single family in Toronto. Well, that's great. But keep in mind, if you're going to refinance and you expect to pull your money out and then rent and cover your costs, you're probably not going to be you know, able to do that unless you're doing a conversion or something uh, on a bigger scale with units. Single families, you know, at a certain price point, they don't cover your costs. So as you're buying and as you're looking into those, those areas, it's important to understand that piece. And then on the other hand, if you've got a property in a market where whatever you do for the renos, it's barely going to give you that lift. It might only, let's just say you buy something for 150 or 200 and you're putting in a 50K reno and it's only going to increase by 50K. That's probably also not a good market for that kind of strategy. That's probably more of a good buy and hold as an example. So you've got to look at, you know, what is going to happen to all of the R's, right? Your renos, your rents, your refinance, your repeat when you buy. So you actually have to be um, pretty well versed in like, everything that a buy and hold person will or investor will have to do, everything that a flipper is going to have to do. And you've got to be able to, you know, project what that looks like when it's done as well. When you're looking at uh, properties, how are you finding, are you finding most things uh, through your realtors? Are you finding things off market? Like you mentioned kind of buying right is the key to this entire strategy. So what is it that you use to be able to find and buy the right properties? I think the first thing is just set up your team of experts. So that is a local realtor that is an investor that works with investors that is local because you're going to want them to check these properties for you instead of having to go back and forth and back and forth. Um, and ideally they also have pocket listings, but have a good wholesaler on your team as well, or two or three, get on some of those, um, their buyers lists so that you can also get the off market opportunities. But, you know, I think it all comes down to get to know an area, right? What I see a lot of people make mistakes on is they're looking at like, Peterborough, and then they're going two hours to, you know, or, uh, I don't know, Brampton, and then they're going to St. Catharines, then they're going into Brantford or Woodstock. Those could all be decent markets, but if you're not zoning in on something, a deal is going to come and go before you even know it. So sometimes you've got to be a very quick, um, or you've got to, I mean, there's some properties that I bought, and I'm not saying for you guys to do this, but I've thrown in offers with conditions but like sight unseen because I knew I didn't have the time to do it. But I'll tell you, if I didn't zone in on a market when I first got started, I wouldn't even know what a deal is. So get to know a market really, really well um, and, and build a good team of people that you can trust that are going to do that work for you. But I will tell you, a realtor is not going to be like emailing you every day. Hey, look at this. Those are automatic. By the way, those automatic emails that you get from their matrix, get on top of them, send them emails. What are you doing for me? And, you know, like, are you able to go on this street and see if you can like door knock a little bit, talk to your wholesaler. So I have a lot of different, you know, things coming into you so that you also have the ability to, you know, buy something. So when you're buying properties, uh, we're going to get into the refinance later, but on the initial purchase, are you using uh, private capital? Or are you using bank financing? Because I know there are some regulations now that are coming out where it's like banks, a, a chartered banks don't necessarily want to see you do a refinance within that 12 months. So are you still using them? Or are you still finding success there on the purchase side? So have both options ready to go. Because I'll tell you, even if you're pre-approved and a house is missing a kitchen, you are not getting a lender. You'll likely have to go private funds anyway. So have both options. Um, what I've, I found for, for me that's worked is because I like old, dated, ugly houses that don't have tons of issues, right? There's no like water in the basement or big red flags where a bank or a lender might say, mm, I don't like this. Um, I've been able to use bank financing. Mm -hmm. And there are some lenders, not all of them, um, there are some lenders that will let you do a refinance within three months, within six months. Some don't want to do it within a year. So you have to make sure that you do work with a good mortgage broker. Here's my plan. Walk them through what your plan is. Here's ideally like the timeline. Here's what I'd like to refinance. And then they're going to pair you with that lender because not all lenders will look at the same thing. Um, if you can use bank financing, you know, 20% uh, down, 30 year AM, that's better than 
finding private money, but I'll tell you, private money right now, especially right now, is easier to find because everyone wants to loan out their money and there's not enough deals, but um, have both options there and go variable, right? Variable rates will allow you to break your mortgage and refinance without the crazy penalties that a fixed mortgage will. So variable all the way. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, let's talk about renovation. Um, one of my favorite subjects, but uh, tell, tell us how you go about, you know, picking what you do on a, on a project and who takes care of that. Do you have a contracting team? Do you do some of that yourself with sweat equity? How do you manage renovations? I'll tell you, if I were to do it myself, I would make it worse. <laughs> I'm a big, big believer in delegating and hiring the right people on your team to be able to do it. But you know what? I've done it. I've done it two ways. I've done it where I was managing the trades. Much cheaper to do, but more time consuming, right? Um, and I've done it where I hired a contractor that was overseeing everything because I just didn't have a lot of time. Yes, it cost me more, but the house made more sense to do it that way. Um, so you, you can do both, right? So if you're not handy, don't worry about it. You can still do this stuff. You can still do rentals. I personally like, I mentioned, um, old houses that are in, have good bones, right? If I don't have a big foundation issue, the plumbing is fairly good. Um, the electrical is fairly good. There's always going to be some things to, to do. The windows are fairly good. Um, the big ticket items that cost a lot of money that don't get you that lift, I'd like those to be somewhat in decent shape so that I can focus on the flooring, the bathroom, the kitchen, the stuff that sounds, you know, sounds stupid, but cosmetic, um, you know, renovations will actually get you your best bang for your buck because that is going to give you your, your highest after repair value. So if I can go in something and say, I'm going to redo the kitchen, the bathrooms, the flooring, the paints, light fixtures and, you know, like little fixtures like that will add value and that's it. Um, that is, you know, my favorite conversions are also good as well. Prices right now though, um, are not all conducive to uh, conversion. So you just got to look at that piece and really, um, and this goes back to the buy before you buy something and, and you've got to also do run your numbers, understand what your rental cost is going to be, but also understand what the after repair value is going to be before you buy, because you're going to want to make sure that you calculate your profit in there, right? So like if you look at the ARVs and they're not much more for conversion, as an example, if, if you're going to convert, it's going to cost you 120K, but there's not a whole lot that has sold in that area because everyone that's doing it is holding on to those properties, you know, Hamilton on the mountain, as an example, you'll, you won't get those ARVs to be as high. Like you might have to refinance a, a couple times mm -hmm. potentially as the market lifts. Do you think this is the biggest element where people make the most mistakes, Sarah? Like, is this where, you know, like you said earlier, hiring bad contractors or believing that their budget's going to be X and it turns out to be double of that. Um, how can, how can, you know, beginners, novice investors avoid some of these catastrophic mistakes when it comes to burrs? Yeah. I mean, I, I'll tell you, contractors can give you the worst time and unfortunately they can make or break part of your project. The beauty of it is you're going to hold on to it. So it's very forgivable over time. Um, but yes, they can definitely mess up your budget and timelines. So find a good contractor that you trust, get a few quotes, but get your, your team going. And this goes back to the team, right? We talked about mortgage broker. We talked about your wholesalers. We talked about your, your good local, you know, realtors that are investors themselves. Same thing with contractors, you know, work with the ones that have worked with other investors that are doing the strategy in your area that you are looking to buy into. You know, the other thing I think with renovations is people over renovate. If you're in an, in a B market, and you're in an area like Brantford, they don't need the fanciest stuff. They just want things that are clean. You know, there's different standards versus, versus Toronto or Oakville or even Burlington. So the biggest thing I would say is just, you're not living there. This is a, an investment. So what renovations do you need to do to get that maximum after repair value? And that's it. Is anything more you're going to do? You're, you're not going to be able to pull that money out. So Check with, check with, uh, you know, with others that have been doing it in your area, go see the projects, talk to your contractors, see what they've done for other investors, make sure that you're happy with those finishes and ask them about those numbers. And, and oftentimes they're going to share with you, here's what this investor bought it for. Here's how much it costs. Here's his appraisal. Um, that will be able to give you a lot of information as well. Are you finding on most of your projects, because I think there's a perception when people are burring and they're, you know, they're, they're really able to do it well, that they're pulling out all of their capital on that refinance. In your experience, are you often leaving capital in? And is that the expectation? Yeah, if you're going to look for that perfect burr, you're going to be looking for a long time because I'm looking for that perfect burr and probably everybody else that does, you know, a bunch of them will be looking for that as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, you know, for me personally, if I can pull out all of my rental money and then let's just call it half of my down payment money, I'm happy. Um, Cause you could always refinance again, right? Let the market lift you up, you know, a year or two refinance the rest out. And, and that's great. Have I done, you know, a burr where I got everything back and then made an extra 40 grand? Absolutely. But, you know, we can't sit here and say, this is what you're going to have to look for. This is what you're going to do. This is Canada, right? We're, we're in a market that has different fundamentals than the U.S. So could you do it in the U.S.? Probably. At the end of the day, um, we are in a market with, I think, some of the best fundamentals ever where we have that um, very low vacancy rate. We have the ability to have tenants, hopefully you pick your tenants that don't stay forever, right? In three to five years, they get out, you reset your market rents, market rents go up like 10% a year, maybe more, but you can't do, you know, price increases uh, of, of that nature necessarily, unless you've got a property that was built after 2018, different story. Um, thank you Ford for that. But, you know, there are some things to consider when it comes to that. So talk us through refinancing. What do you do after your property has been renovated? When do you start the refinance process? Do you start that as the renovation is finishing up or when it's done and you have tenants in place already? I try to refi after. So if I'm going to do a long-term tenant, because I have some that I Airbnb, if I'm doing a long-term tenant, I'll, I'll likely right before the rentals are done or as they're happening, um, I'll start actually screening tenants, posting, advertising, bring uh, people through. Uh, tenant screening is so important. So I'll, I'll, you know, go through that process. If I can show the appraiser, here is um, what the tenant is going to be paying. Cause sometimes they will estimate and their estimates is always lower. And I usually can, can push it up as, you know, as far as that market will take it for the rents. I like to have the rent, um, you know, or uh, the uh, Ontario uh, tenant lease agreement ready to go. That standard lease agreement ready to go for them. Um, but I will, refinance it before they move into the actual property because it will look the nicest that way. When, um, when you're doing your refinance, uh, can you explain just a little bit about um, the process and how that works? Because I think for people that have never done this before, um, you know, explain, you, you get your first mortgage, you do your reno, you get your second mortgage and how that all, that payout and all the, and what, what you get to take home. Yeah. So when you're doing a refi, there's actually two ways that you can do a refi. You can, and it depends on the lenders. Um, but if you're already with an, you know, with a standard bank lender, as an example, usually they would have given you for the first time going in and buying the property, 80% loan to value. Right. Um, so what would happen is they go in. So the, you say, okay, well, you know, I'm good. I can start uh, doing the appraisal. They go in and, and they give you your value. There's two ways that you can take it. You can do it as a cash out refinance, meaning that the 80% uh, loan to value of the new mortgage minus what you have left to pay is what you can pull out as cash. So that means that your mortgage payments are going to be higher because now you're, you're adding um, to the mortgage payments, but you have that as cash. So if you have a HELOC that you need to pay down or the property still can cash flow really well and you want the money for whatever reason, you can do the cash. You could also do a HELOC. If you do a HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit, um, that's, you know, that's a great option as well. If you don't need a, all of the money and you can do a combination of both. If you don't need all of the money, or if you don't have something else to buy, um, necessarily right now, you don't have it. If you don't have a HELOC to pay, uh, down and you don't want to necessarily pay for the higher mortgage, a HELOC is a great example. The other thing too, is some banks, some lenders, um, do not allow you to use now your down payments, uh, for that next property, not all lenders, some lenders. So, you know, there are workarounds on that. So just to take a step back, if you guys are wondering what's happening, it's, it's actually this one's with Scotia. Scotia does not want your property to be purchased using a HELOC at this point. So here's the thing, move the money over, put in another account, get it vested there, work with your mortgage broker to see how long you need to vest it there and problem solved, right? So there's always workarounds on everything, um, but just good, work with a good mortgage broker. But there, and that was a COVID related um, rule that they're not planning on keeping forever, but that is, uh, you know, a little bit of a block at that point in time. Let's talk about renting the properties. How do we now, once they're renovated and we've purchased them, um, refinanced, uh, either, you know, before or after tenants, how are you finding great quality tenants, uh, to put in your buildings? Yeah. I mean, this is like the most important part, I think, I mean, I feel like I say all of them is important. Every part is important, but, but in Ontario, this is super important because I'll tell you, if you want dry reading, but really interesting reading, read the, the Residential Tenancies Act and you will realize how in Ontario, we are so geared towards tenants and landlords. We don't have a whole lot of opportunity. 
the big opportunity that we have is to be able to pick and choose our own tenants mm. and to do a really good job screening. So, you know, I actually have five steps and they go through the five steps and they know that they are going to be, you know, going through a lot of due diligence um, before they even, you know, potentially even have the opportunity to actually know my name and even where the property is. So, you know, step one, I actually, I actually do a, a post on Kijiji and everybody's got their own things. I personally like Kijiji for the um, fact that I can stay anonymous and I can ask specific questions. Tenants have to actually answer these questions in order to move to the next step two. If they don't, I'll tell you, screen out as many as you can. Um, and especially in a time like this, you know, there, there might be tenants that are rent striking. There might be tenants that just got behind because of um, losing their jobs. It's unfortunate, but you don't want to be inheriting those tenants, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's just really important, crucial steps that you need to take. Um, then I actually have a phone screening with them. I have a list of questions that I ask them. The ones that like I am comfortable with moving to that next step. Then at that point in time, I will actually have them um, come and see the property. They have a, an application to fill out with a bunch of other questions. Um, and then there's actually an interview for the ones that I pick. Um, but you know, once, once they fill out the, the questionnaire, like I'll be running their credit. I'm going to be running their names through my paralegal. I'm going to be, you know, doing social media checks. Like there's a whole list of things that you want to do. Um, and then I actually do an interview with them. Cause I'm like, if you're going to be my tenant for five years, are we going to be able to communicate you know, do you know, can we speak to each other? Do I trust you? Do I, you know, um, those are all just, you got to trust your gut too and, and parts of this, right? Um, and only then do they get the lease and my 20 page addendum to review before we screen. So I'll tell you, so, and, and the ones that drop off the, or the ones that have sob stories or the ones that, you know, there's so many red flags along the way, um, vacancy rates, again, we have that, that opportunity to do that where we are here in Ontario in the States where they might have eight, 10% vacancies, you know, it's a different story. Um, where tenants don't pay, they can get them out, you know, within two months, different story. You know, here, you know, we have a bad tenant, you are stuck with them probably for like nine to 12 months, especially with the, the LTB and the landlord tenant board being closed and maybe reopening in September. So very, be very cautious. And I know I'm like very passionate about it because mm -hmm. it's important. Like we have, you know, we have great tenants, and, and we, you know, we want to be great landlords for them too, but you know, you want to make sure that you don't have the ones that are going to be taking advantage or, you know, they, they won't be able to pay. Um, so do a very good job screening and we can have a whole conversation about like every single step and dissecting it. But, you know, don't be that person that says here, I have cash first and last and then, okay, no problem. Here are the keys. Those, the, unfortunately, those tenants will look for the people that are you know, have no process and procedure and the easy ones. And that's the ones, unfortunately, that I feel bad for them because they go, they go through hell. Yeah. I always say the bad tenants are looking for bad landlords. <laughs> yeah, that's true. How do you um, figure out a way to be able to do this uh, as quickly and efficiently as possible? Uh, are there some things we've kind of left out to this point where you see as a way to be able to repeat uh, sooner? Have, have you learned a few things in your years of, of the projects that have been able to uh, give you more cash to be able to repeat this process? I think the whole process allows you to repeat it. So don't take that money and spend it on a boat, even though a boat is nice, you know, <laughs> take that money and reinvest it. So I'll tell you that like for, for the first four or five years of doing real estate investing, all the money from the cash flow, all our money from, you know, the mortgage pay down, the appreciation, the refis, it was all going back into the business. Mm -hmm. um, and that's allowed us to, to be able to scale. If you can live on your job income um, as much as possible before you quit, rather than starting to take all the, the proceeds too soon, you're going to be able to use that to really, you know, snowball um, your, your success and your progress a lot faster. And the, the other thing I would just say, if you want to, you know, accelerate it a little bit, um, I'm always a big believer in having your own properties. If you're going to do it on your own, you're listening to this, you know, the show with Darren and you want to learn and you're going to take action, do it on your own. And then what you're going to see is going to, that's going to happen afterwards is people are going to come start talking to you. Hey, how do I get in? How do I joint venture? Do you need a partner? And then you can use their money. You can use their financing. Um, and that's how you can scale. But it, I think for me, it was important to get my own portfolio going because I have hundred percent control over it and I don't have to exit because like, you always want to need an exit strategy if you're going to joint venture. I didn't want to exit in five years or seven years. I needed to have my, my nest egg properties. And then you want to accelerate. Perfect. Accelerate. Use somebody else's money and financing that may not be as interested in being involved and spending the time, but they want to get a better return than the stock market or their GIC or whatever they're in. 
perfect partner for if for the listeners that want to be that active person. So many great points. I mean, we, there's probably 30 points you brought up today that I thought were just like knocked out of the park. Uh, you know this strategy inside and out, and I'm so grateful that you were able to to join me today and just just walk everybody through it. So thanks so much for being here. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the session with Sarah, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for both Sarah and myself. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. Sarah, thanks again for, for joining me, uh, taking some time out of your day, out of your cottage life to, uh, to talk us through the birth strategy. I wish you the best of success in your real estate investing journey, and hopefully our paths will cross very soon. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being on and, uh, and thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks, Sarah.